You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Good evening, everyone. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of our praise. To you, our hearts we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. God bless you. God bless you, everyone. I know you're just coming in tonight. I am just setting everything up for our drop-in gems Q&A. Don't go nowhere. We are getting your questions answered tonight on this March 2021. We didn't get a chance to do it the, be the beginning of the month last month, but we're going to keep on doing it. We're going to keep on doing it at the end of the month. But thanks be to God that we didn't skip it this month because we're going into a new season. And I know all y'all need your questions heard. For, um, all are answered, I should say. So for all of you that are coming online tonight, I welcome you. Just welcome somebody coming online. Say, God is awesome in this place when you're coming on tonight. So good to see you. My name is Alicia Breeze. For those of you who don't know, I'm just a simple woman that loves God. I'm here to get you spiritually and naturally free from narcissistic abuse and all toxicity of all kinds. Subscribe to this channel. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, wherever you're at, you know I love you and you know I got you, fam. And we're getting into it tonight. So please make your questions and comments heard in this broadcast. If you like, if you want to share it, just press the, the like button. If you want to um, press the notification so you can find out when all this hot drop and gems information is coming online, you can always check me out um, on uh, YouTube, okay, or, or Instagram or Facebook or what all these, all these social media outlets I can't even keep up. But anyways, we had an amazing series last week. We're getting into these questions and we're going right into it. We're not going to take any more time, but of course, we can't do nothing unless we get to pray, okay? Put your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight, Lord God. We thank you that you brought us to this place. We thank you, oh God, that you said in your word with all thy getting, get understanding. So we're thanking you tonight for the illumination of your word, the illumination of our own hearts, and the illumination of the world that we're living in, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you, God. I pray for your divine revelation. We come against the snares of the enemy that has seek to choke out the word tonight, but we know your word always prevails, and we know that you always get the victory, and if we're in you tonight, we know that we got the victory, because you are awesome all the time in this place tonight, Lord God. We give you all the glory for what you're about to do, and we pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go. Amen. So the first question tonight, let me tell you, we got 20 questions. All right, they just came flooding in in the last like 48 hours. So I was just working and, and doing what I had to do to get this information to you. If you know somebody who needs this information, share it tonight. We know that we're, we're still on lockdown. We still in a pandemic. We need this information. So um, if you need, if you know somebody, if you want to host a watch party tonight, you can do that as well. But let's get into it. First question up. And remember, you can interrupt me anytime. Yes, God bless you in Jesus' name. You can interrupt me anytime, leave a message, a comment, and I will be sure to answer it tonight. Number one, why, if you don't keep no contact, do narcissists keep saying they want you back if they really discarded you and devalued you? Great question. Well, let's get into it, okay? If you want to understand people with narcissistic personality disorder, just a little better. You have to learn to add the following two qualifying the words at the end of every statement, okay? So if the narcissist says something to you like, I want you, or I'm having a great time with you, you need to add these two words for now, okay? So every time a narcissist, you know, talks about you've broken no contact with them, they might be hoovering you, they might be sending you text messages, they might be sending you voicemails, DMs, whatever it is, Whatever they say, I want you to add for now. So let's go through what that would look like. One is, I want you for now. That's what we add. The narcissist says, I love you madly. You've got to add for now, okay? If they say, I promise to love you forever, you've got to add for now. You get my drift? Let's go through it. I am not, not taking anything for granted tonight, okay? 
If they say, I see how wrong I was, I made mistakes for now. You've got to mentally put that into your brain, okay? Because nothing lasts with the narcissist. They're only living in the moment and the spontaneity of that moment right there. They could, that, that feeling can be fleeting within like 30 minutes, okay? So if they say, I will never leave you again. I will never cheat on you again. I will never lie to you again. You've got to add for now in your own mind, okay? I, and if they say, you disgust me for now. If they say, I never want to see you again, don't call me. I don't, I, I'm dead to you. That is simply just add for now, okay? Because what does all of this mean? You're probably asking. The answer is quite simple. They usually believe whatever they are telling you, but, the, it, but that does not make it the whole truth, okay? People like narcissists, okay, they lack something called whole object relations, all right? An object constancy. This makes them inherently unstable. There's a scripture that says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so we see that. That's why you see the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of thing. And if we talk about this, we talk about this spiritually. This is a spiritual conversation. There are things that are affecting, attacking, using, influencing, whatever you want to create um, that narcissist, to create that level of inst 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 instability so that there's like, what's going on? It's like there's a confusion. Nothing is consistent. Nothing remains the same. It changes, could be throughout the day, throughout the week. There are very clear patterns when you start to observe this behavior. And so one moment they can be loving, but if something trivial even triggers that hurt or anger or rage or disappointment, everything positive that they felt before disappears from their consciousness. And this is why, you, 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 like I said, you're like, what? 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 Okay, these are the types of things that go through your mind. You're like, what's going on here? So no ma matter how emphatic, and I mean, they were when they were discarded, you, if they find themselves lonely or, or drunk or bored or they're craving like sexual attention or something like that, they might send you a text message saying, what are you up to? Or I miss you right now. Or, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? All of this can be very confusing for healthy people, balanced people who actually mean what they say. So if this is you and you are being told by the person or the narcissist who devalued you and discarded you and broke, you know, your life, your heart, your mind, whatever, and they're saying, I need you, this time will be different. You need to take a pause and take a deep breath and you need to pray. You need to be like, you know what, God, this is this for victims of these people, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever, mothers, fathers, whatever it is, there's a temptation because there's something in you that so badly wants to believe what the person is saying. But you have to understand that the narcissist doesn't think like you, doesn't feel like you, doesn't move like you. They move different. And so you have to assess these things. So before you leap back into that person's presence and you break no contact, or, you know, whatever, like you're just feeling like you want to be connected to this person, add the words for now. Are you writing this? You need to get a pen and paper. You need to write this down. Everybody need to take notes tonight because we're dropping gems. It's dripping. Okay. So to everything they tell you and they see if what it is still being offered sounds appealing, you need to add for now. Okay. Number two, what will happen if I go back to the narcissist? Is it true? Somebody's asking a great question tonight. Yes. Good, good evening, my sister. Spread this broadcast. All of you all over the world. I forgot to greet you all, all the way down south in Florida, California, in, in the rest of Canada, the West Indies, man, England. We got you here on Shooting the Breeze. So stay tuned. Keep this on. Spread this to somebody. So what will happen if I go back to the narcissist? Is it true that it will get worse? Okay, this is the short answer. I've said this before, okay? I'm just going to tell you straight up, yes, okay? But let's go explain this, okay? Narcissists will continue to do whatever they did the last time once the courtship was over, once the love bumming was over, once the romantic da 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 da, da was over, okay? If they abused you before, they will start abusing you again. If their mm -hmm. abuse even escalated, all right? during the time that you were together, they will escalate their abuse again, all right? 
Why will they still abuse you? Even this is what someone else asked in addition. Why will they still abuse you even though they beg to come back? Right? That's the question, right? And said everything would be different this time, right? If you take a moment to think about this now and just you go through, because you, you, it's like you get amnesia. Like when you go through the memories, you go through the facts, okay? The facts are very important of what has occurred in that dynamic. You will understand that unless they have had extensive and very effective psychotherapy on an ongoing basis, remember this is a personality disorder as well, unless they are getting consistent help on an ongoing basis with accountability, with tools and, 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 and people to watch over them, all right? Or, or that they can speak to who are professionals, okay? They cannot have changed unless they had an encounter, a Nebuchadnezzar like we talked last week. Last week we talked mm -hmm. about what it would look like if a narcissist changed and we talked about divine intervention from God. And so if you didn't catch that video last week, it's so important because people think like, listen to me, let me tell you, when you go through the Bible, there's many narcissists. Most narcissists did not repent. This person, King Nebuchadnezzar, is a great example for those of you who want to know what would it look like. It ain't no joke. It's not calling you on DMing you and saying, baby, I want to come back to you. It doesn't work like that. God intervenes and things get shut down. Things get broken down. Pride comes before the fall. And you will see on that episode, please, please watch it. Please, please watch it. I am telling you, go to the YouTube channel. It's last week. It'll be, let, this is going to be posted on like next week, Thursday. But if you haven't caught it already, watch it, okay? This is a personality disorder, narcissism. All that has happened is that they want you back. All when they're calling you and they're hoovering you, they just want you back in their life again and are willing to say anything to achieve that goal. They're not willing to do the work or do the transformation or whatever, do the true repentance from the inside, from the soul, from the heart out, because they don't possess the things that carry that level of conviction, all right? And so they may have even convinced themselves that they want you back because they want you again, and they've convinced themselves that they will behave better. It's like a drug addict. It's like when you get that crack cocaine and you're like, this is my last hit. I promise I'm not going to do it again because you're high. You know, you already have the high, but when that high comes down and a few days go back, you know that addict is going to be sniffing around for more. So even that addict believes that this is going to be the last time. The narcissist believes this is going to be the last time. I'm not going to do this person wrong anymore, but they can't help themselves because they have not submitted to a higher sovereign power. They have not submitted themselves to help counseling psychotherapy. And I'm not just talking about, you know, on the lower level of counseling, I'm talking about real psychological help. All right. So with narcissistic personality disorder, they're all equipped for, wait a second, people with narcissistic personality disorder are ill equipped, I mean to say, for the give and take and mutual respect that takes place in a sustaining, satisfying intimate relationships. And this also goes into like family relationships as well with siblings and, and parental parents and even children. All right. And so everyday life can be very, very difficult with them, even when the two of you start off with the best of intentions. All right. I need you to understand that the narcissistic mate may not intend to abuse you once they are back in your life again, but as they have not magically developed any new coping methodologies or strategies or change how they are thinking, they, they are still, if you're dealing with even a Christian or some a narcissist that claims to be a Christian, their mind hasn't been converted, their mind hasn't been delivered. And so therefore, the, 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 the Bible says, um, you, the just shall live by faith. So there's there's no inherent faith that they're leaning upon. There's no godly godly mindset. They might know the rules. They might know the religious aspect. They might know the scriptures. But they have they're the ones that hear the word but don't do it. All right. And so um, they allow their behavior. They justify their behaviors. They justify their way of thinking. They justify the distorted reality to fit their own narrative. Somebody say amen. If you are feeling this tonight, I need you to light up the screen with flames of fire, okay? 
They become extremely self-centered, unable to see the validity of anyone else's point of view. There's no emotional empathy or very, very little using grandiosity and devaluing as their major defenses, all right? We go through this. There's a lot of repetition tonight because some people are just logging in. If you're coming in, you need to stay here tonight because narcissism is pervading our society on a, on, a, on a ridiculous level. Yes, girl, I know you hear me. It's in your workplaces. It's in your families. It's in your communities. And so we got to stay woke tonight. And this is why we have to keep our eyes attuned, our ears attuned to what the spirit of God is saying and who's giving us wisdom even in the world. Not all wisdom. Wisdom is spiritual and wisdom is practically, uh, um, practically, um, you know, applied, right? So these narcissists are unwilling to compromise, very controlling, likely to suddenly get mad at you, like all of a sudden and behave very badly. They might escalate small agreements into major battles. God bless you coming in tonight, okay? And so escalating small disagreements into major battles, this means that when things get just a little difficult, or you're not in perfect agreement with them, they will fall back by using their usual coping mechanisms like devaluation, devaluating you, being uncooperative and very mean, like straight up, like mean, okay? And turning small disagreements into big fights. Why are you asking? Because this, this is all they know how to do. It's to deflect, all right? It's to deflect it and project it and turn things around and play those narcissistic mind games that we talked about in the Game Over series. See how it's all coming together? You see it? All right, number three, we're going through it tonight. If you have a question, make sure you make it known. Even if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you leave your questions. I will always, and my team will always come back to answer. So number three, what does it mean when a narcissistic husband, this is a good one, treats me with disdain? invalidating and minimizing during public gatherings with friends and relatives. Woo, child. This behavior is contrary to how they are normally described and is confusing. This is a great question, all right? Let me, let's go through the basic ways narcissists will treat their mate in public that are very rude and invalidating. This is so important tonight to answer these questions, because there's people sitting right now by themselves, their life is just, years are going by and they're stuck in a state of confusion and frustration and no validation because there's not enough awareness, there's not enough understanding, but Alicia Breeze, Shooting the Breeze, the team, whatever is here to validate what you're saying, you're not losing your mind, okay? So um, let's get into this. Not all narcissists are alike. Okay, let's start out with the reminder that there are so many different types of people that are diagnosed and people that are not diagnosed because like we say before, they don't seek help. So a lot of times, listen, we can't wait for the narcissist to go to the doctor. We have to be able to discern and, and make decisions and make difficult choices at this time. And that's what it is. But with God, he will strengthen you. He will guide you and he'll bring you into all truth. All right. A lot of these people share basic issues that led them to getting certain diagnosis, okay? So they, narcissists find their own ways of expressing their narcissism in the world. That's the simplest way to know how to put it. So there's three subtypes, okay? There's the exhibitionist, which is very overt and grandiose. There's the closet narcissist, which is very covert and insecure. And then there's the, the one that people, you've probably heard this before, that is like this is like the, the worst kind is malignant, it means they're covert and overt and sadistic to add to that. And that's where we talk about that demonic element to it, where there's a level of, um, you know, heightened, like high, when they're, they're getting away with evil scheming ways, there's a something that you cannot see. Again, this is why we need the spirit of God to guard us and, to, and we have to pray and we have to safeguard ourselves and allow um, God to move in us and allow us to discern the spirits, to know if it's of God, to test the spirit, because you ain't going to see it. The Bible says it very clean, clearly that even the elect will be deceived. Let me tell you, let us humble ourselves right now, okay? The Bible says that Lucifer uh, masquerades as an angel of light. And so, therefore, we can't always rely on what we see or our carnal abilities to discern what's going on. So let's get into this tonight. 
The spouses of each of these three groups find themselves somewhat different issues. So the question was this, just to remind you, is what are the basic ways that narcissists treat their mate in public that are rooted in validating? That's like the short form, okay? So the, there, let's talk about it. There's the part, I, I call it the party patterns, okay? I've nicknamed these patterns called the poppy show party patterns, okay? Because they often occur when the couple is going out to a social event or out publicly and there are other people are present and they, they occur because narcissists are extremely self sergeant and are focused only on their point of view and lack emotional empathy. So the first pattern you're going to see, right, through with the, this type of nar these type of narcissists is the ignoring, okay? So in this pattern, the narcissistic partner is an extrovert and does not want to be hampered in any way by their mate's presence at this party. Let's just picture a party, okay? The, the poppy show party, all right? So they basically enter the party with their mate and then they leave them standing alone. Like they leave them completely. They're not engaging. Even when the person's the mate might be trying to talk to them, they just completely ignore them. They could be... Um, it could be a holiday office party. It could be a college reunion. But the meeting is the, the spouse is there, but they're not. They're interacting with everybody but the spouse. Okay. So um, then, and then therefore, that spouse is now feeling like a little bit like let's let's be real, like a little bit like kind of lonely, a little bit awkward. Like you're there with your spouse, but your spouse is not interacting. But they're interacting with everybody else, and nothing even transpired before that, right? And so. Some of these narcissistic partners use the party as an opp opportunity to flirt or to engage with other people um, inappropriately, right? It, 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 in, in, in plain sight, basically, right? So while they see their spouse flirting, the victims will see their spouse flirting with attractive strangers, sometimes even take down numbers. You know, you, you question about it. They're like, oh, this is a client. Oh, this is someone who needs help. This is someone like this, all right? They haven't introduced you because you're at the party but they're working the party. It's called the poppy show party. Yes, yes. You think I'm lying? I ain't lying. That's why we're here tonight. We're unmasking the truth, all right? And so they, they'll basically gaslight or lie to say they created a business connection like they said, all right? So when you begin to complain and you call it out, that narcissistic spouse might get angry or laugh and, or mock you. They'll say things like, please, you're imagining things. You're crazy, you know? I'm not an erg, I'm, they might say, I'm not ignoring you when they obviously are. They'll be like, don't be sour. This is a party. We're supposed to talk to other people. Like we don't need to be together. They'll say things like this. This, and they'll say, maybe, maybe make you feel bad about it, right? For calling me out. They might say things like, this is why I shouldn't bring you nowhere. This is why I don't bring you nowhere. All right. And it's not my fault. It's not my fault that you're shy and totally lack social skills and totally awkward. So I'm giving you examples of how that looks like. And they might say, you know, I'm not flirting. What are you talking about? I'm just socializing. I'm just, I'm, I'm just making contacts with people. So even when you call it out, again, no accountability, gaslighting, put it projecting blame and shame, mind games. So maybe you might feel like, I just got checked. Maybe I should just chill here and be quiet and have my Perrier by myself. Mm-hmm, girl. By the way, I got the no name today. No Perrier. Boo. Okay, so pattern number two, fight, then pretend. That's another pattern. The fight, the big fight, and then the pretending like there wasn't a fight. So in this scenario, the narcissistic partner is incredibly outrageously mean, okay, to their spouse before they leave for the party, for the poppy show party, okay? They may pick a fight over something super trivial. They may escalate it and then threaten to leave without their spouse. They may create a crisis so the spouse will pull themselves together or else they will be exposed as well. However, this type of person with narcissistic personality disorder, disorder likes to pretend that they have like a super good marriage in public. So the minute they arrive after the outrageous, mean, outburst, crisis, chaos, crazy, you know, the narcissist starts enacting the part of the calm, cool, happy person with a great relationship. They will try to hold your hand. They might try to kiss you. They're going to try to touch you. They're going to play with your hair. They're going to like start saying really nice things to you. And you're just like, again, you're like, what? Like as you're wiping away the tears from your eyes, you're like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Okay. So the minute they arrive, the narcissist starts enacting this. 
They will do all this stuff, try and touch you. Like, you know, most spouses cannot shit. Most people, healthy people, can't transition from crisis to like laid back and cool and, you know, let's forget about it. Let's just forget about the scrap. Let's just forget about that you called me this like two minutes ago before you walked into the party. All this type of stuff. So most people cannot shift that first from devastation and tears to a happy, you know, countenance, right? So this in itself just simply it enrages the narcissist. And I have known situations where at home there was an incredibly violent fight. I have seen this, I have witnessed this, where there's something incredibly terrible and the non-narcissistic narcissistic spouse was thoroughly devalued, thoroughly offended, thoroughly insulted, and might even been hit physically, whatever. They're crying hysterically and they're lamenting their situation and thinking about divorce and thinking about this has to stop. And then 15, minute late, 15 minutes later, they are expected to cover their red eyes and, and make up and, and put on makeup and put on sunglasses and walk into the party as if they are the happiest couple in the world. This is the poppy show party, y'all, okay? If they complain to their spouse or say they cannot go feeling like this, like, I need a minute, I can't do this, we just had this crazy and now we're walking into the poppy show party, their narcissistic spouse makes threats and invalidates their experience. So again, this is what it would sound like. If you don't go, that's what I'm saying, sister. God bless you. Come on in. If you don't go, you will regret it, okay? It, you are going, even if I have to drag you there, okay? You are so selfish. You are such a drama queen or a drama king. I don't know what you call a guy who's a drama queen, but you know, you're so overreacting. If you don't go, it just teaches me that I should look for someone else to bring next time. Would you like that better? That's a familiar one. Or you are lucky that I want to take you. Now put on that face and let's go. So you see, crazy. Let's take a minute. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Pattern number three. This is not a good one. Public humiliation. This is a pattern that often starts about the time that the narcissistic partner loses their desire to please the spouse. So now like, this is when the mask is just gonna, it's just falling off. Like the narcissist is over. They're like, you know what? This is, this is too much just for whatever reasons, right? The mask is off. The narcissist is now beginning to show themselves 100, all right? It's real, I know, right? The narcissist is being themselves. They're, now they're easily irritated, okay? They have unrealistic expectations. They're like super uncaring, okay? They are now exhibiting, exhibiting open contempt for their mate, both in private and now in public. They no longer feel any real attachment or allegiance to their spouse. They feel free to do whatever they want. The narcissist gonna do what they're gonna do. It is what it is. They're just, you just sit there and you're like, wow, this, this, this girl, this guy, whoever is not even holding back, they're going to treat me garbage in private. And now they're starting to treat me garbage in public. Uh-uh. All right. So for example, at a party there, they may, they may, may be very disrespectful, devaluing comments mm -hmm. about their spouse to other people. They might be doing triangulation, which we talked about before. So you're at the party, but they're going around or whoever they're talking to, they're just like, yeah, this girl, look what she did on the way here. Like, you don't even know what is happening, right? They might make nasty jokes at your expense. Um, if, if, the, if you maybe say something to stand up for yourself in the midst of that public, you know, humiliation, all right? Um, you might get publicly chastised, put in check by the narcissist. This is the stage where you see the narcissist really has no rules. Like there's, they just don't care, okay? They're gonna do whatever they're gonna do, like I said before. They may even expect you to allow it, ignore it, not retaliate, keep your mouth shut, don't say nothing, not put up any boundaries. Even if you do, they're stripping them down, they're stripping them down, 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 okay? Things will be said like this. Man, you're such a drag, you're, you're a hater, whatever. I don't know why I bother bringing you anywhere. Just leave, just leave, just leave. Just grab your stuff and go, bounce. You know, they'll do crazy stuff. Or even worse, the narcissistic mate leaves them at the party without transportation home. I'm giving you a picture, okay? I'm giving you an illustration. This happens to people, okay? Um, 
and they might have to go in with someone else. The punchline is this. Past the honeymoon stage of the love bombing of that narcissistic relationship it is quite common for people with who are narcissists to treat their spouses in a disdainful, invalidating way in public, moving between these types of patterns that we just discussed. So you can go back and look at that. This is a common complaint that I have heard from a lot of people, okay? So number four, we're banging these out tonight. We have 20, it's already 7.30, okay. Why can't I tell the narcissist how I really feel about how they treated me? Amazing question, okay? I see a comment coming in. Or thank you, Samantha. What's up, girl? Or you'll try to leave and they will threaten to expose all your secrets or literally threaten your life. Exactly. What many times narcissists do, the whole love bomb stage, the whole relationship is them extracting all your weaknesses, all the things that you don't want people to know about you, and especially if you're sharing in an intimate relationship. And they will use that information you know, later on, like as leverage to, to, you know, to, you know, threaten you, like you said, and threaten to expose you. It's the whole blame sh shaming and shift, uh, sin shifting game that I've, mind game that I've talked about in past episodes, but you're absolutely right. And it's disgusting. It's terrible. Right? So our next question, why can't a narcissist, why can't I tell a narcissist how I really feel about how they treated me? This is huge. OK, this is so huge because you're sitting there. You almost feel powerless. You're like, I want to tell this person. I want to confront this person. You might want to fight this person. You might want to have revenge on this person. It is a real temptation. But what are we doing tonight? We need God to honor us, honor. Our, we need God in our decision because we've gone through and so many of you have gone through so much hell and back. We are walking in the blessing right now. OK, how can the spouse empower themselves? And we're going to get to that, Pastor. Bless you, okay? We're getting to that question tonight. So um, why can I, oh my gosh, I keep repeating this. But why can't I tell a narcissist how we feel? Okay, of course you can tell someone with narcissism how you really feel about how miserably and how terribly they treated you. But the problem is, it's like it's, the ball's not on your side of the fence. It's on their side. So you can perfectly throw that info ball over to the narcissist, over the fence, but they will either step aside or, and it never reaches them, or they will get angry and smash the ball back at your head. Like my analogies, okay? You need to be a realistic about what to expect. And here are a few of the usual things that people are hoping for when they decide to confront a narcissist, okay? If I, this is, this is what you think is going to happen when you confront the narcissist. Number one, change. All right. You think if I tell them how they hurt me, they will finally understand and will change their behavior towards me in the future. They will have an aha moment and see how bad they have treated me and repent for it. That's the one thing you think is going to happen. All right. And this is why we have to bring every single thought into subjection to God. All right. There's so many scriptures, I can't get it. I'm going to do a whole video on this so that we can get the scriptural references, all right? The other thing that you think is going to happen is there's going to be remorse if you confront the narcissist. If they really understand how bad they treated me, they will feel remorse and they will apologize. That's mistake number two. The other thing that you're going to think uh, want when you deal with the narcissist is revenge, right? Um, it will feel great. Some of you are dabbling like, you're imagining, you're fantasizing that moment where like, it will feel great to finally tell them off, all right? Let them see how it feels to be criticized and devalued and discarded and have their self-esteem and their life and their heart ripped to shreds, okay? And here are some of the responses that people who tell the narcissistic person what they really feel get in response. So you think all this stuff, this is what you get in response. You get attacked, okay? You'll be called your excuse my language, but you're an idiot or you're whatever, right? You need to shut up. You want to hear what I really feel? You will get attacked, okay? That's number one that will happen. There might be a partial admission. Yes, I know I did this and I was wrong, but I never did that, even though you know they did. So you're sitting there and you're like, there's, there's a partial confession. There's no ownership. I will turn into we both did this. It's never saying I did this. Somehow you made the person do it or um, there's or there's no connection. Like the thing that they're blaming for you, blaming you for are completely disproportionate. So they could have gone out and like, you know, in the, they could have a spouse. Um, 
They could have slept with your neighbor's spouse or something, invited them over for dinner. And, you know, you confront them about it and they're like, but you don't clean the house. <laughs> right. Or they might be like, you know, you ignored me the other night. So it's completely disproportionate. Yes, I'm using outlandish examples because they're very realistic, believe it or not. All right. Also, there will be denial. They might say you're making stuff up. It's not true. That never happened. You're paranoid. You're mentally ill. Are, are you like schizophrenic? No, you know, I'm not trying to offend anybody struggling with mental illness, but they will start to just like, just throw that stuff at you, right? Um, so that you're invalidated. They might reject you. They might call you ugly. You know, you're a piece of this, that. No one will want you. I only messed with you out of pity. You're crazy, all this type. So complete rejection. And what we talked about in the last series, the game over series, blame shifty. They might turn around and say, you're the narcissist. They might say, no, you are the narcissist. This and this, my friends, creates a huge level of trauma, okay, for the victims. And this is why no contact is something that we endorse. I endorse 100 because it's during that time where you have, we're going to talk about the difference between gray rocking and, 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 and ignoring and no contact. It's very important because this right here will put a victim of this, of any type of abuse in trauma. It, you know, it, can you trust me? Okay. Um, it's right, because in, in their mind, it's not anybody's fault but yours, okay? And so someone asked a question, and yes, I don't like, I, I always say to you guys that we're not being gender specific, but women are primarily the people that speak out with these questions, so we can still interpret it of how the, in the, in the, for male, men as well, sorry. So number five, how happy is the wife of a narcissist, okay? That could be how happy is the husband of a narcissist. Let me put it this way. If the wife, we're going to use the wife right now, because that was a question I got. If the wife of a narcissist is, ha narcissist is happy, it is not because of the narcissist, all right? It is in spite of her mate having narcissistic personality disorder. If you are married to a narcissist who is not getting effective therapeutic help and changing and you do not want to leave, or for some whatever reasons you cannot leave, that could be on... So for so many reasons, here is what I recommend. And this answers your question, um, uh, Pastor, with respect to how can the spouse empower themselves, okay? This is what I got for you, okay? <laughs> Number one, be realistic. Understand that your spouse is unlikely to change, okay? I always say this, like, especially in faith communities, like, we talked about it last week. God changes people right? We have to work out our own salvation and fear and trembling. So absolutely pray for that spouse, right? But understand that this is something that has to be dealt with on like a very consistent, like if that person doesn't see that they're, they're an error, or there's something wrong. It's you can, we can't control people, man. This is what it is, right? Number, the other thing that you can do to empower yourself, all right, is you cultivate, if you see a, a, a spouse that's like, you know, dealing with this, they've cultivated other friends and they've created support systems. That could be in a faith community. That could be your friend's family. Okay. There are many things that you cannot get from a narcissistic spouse, like things like empathy, stable love, most likely faithfulness, honesty, an actual interest in you as a separate human being. Okay. So you got to find friends who can fill these roles for you. And it ref will reflect back to you the reality uh, reality instead of the false reality that the narcissist is fighting so hard for you to live in or be entangled and be a part of, okay? And so the other thing that you can do or that these seemingly wa like wives of these narcissistic husbands have done is put up boundaries, okay? Most people with narcissistic personality disorder have no boundaries. They don't, or they don't respect your boundaries. They will treat you as badly as you permit, okay? Um, you cannot fight every battle, but choose the ones that are really important to you and, de and defend yourself. You've got to fight for these boundaries, yes. You can't just, when you're dealing with a narcissist, they're ready to strip them down. So you have to stand firm in your boundaries. And that's not going to be a, a smooth ride in a narcissistic marriage or relationship. It's going to be a problem. 
It's going to bring conflict because the narcissist is not wired to respect those boundaries because their proclivity is to control, right? Okay. So this will end up being a full-time job. One hundred. Okay. With every boundary, there will be resistance. There will be backlash. There will be punishment. There will be devaluation. And most likely in Bruce, in front of your face, if not in front of your face, it will be behind your back. Okay. The narcissist needs to find the people they can control. And that's how they get their fix, the narcissistic supply. So whatever you say no to, they will find someone who will say yes. So imagine that if you're in a dynamic like that and you're holding up your boundaries and you say no, guess what? The narcissist isn't necessarily living by the code of ethics that you are. They're not living by the rules. They're not living by the morale. So they will find reason to break those boundaries. And then again, you might not be left with the, with the, with the decisions that you got to make moving forward. Okay. The other thing you got to do is you got to take back lost ground. Okay. At what point does the spouse say enough is enough? Well, this is the thing. Everybody's got their limits. Some people can take a couple of months. Some people can take a couple of decades. And so that has to be between that, that person and God. They have to do, you know, empower themselves with this type of information. They got to empower themselves with the word of God and be able to see that this behavior, um, you know, is, is unacceptable, is not holy, is not righteous. And then they have to you know, be able to confront them. The problem is, especially in society, whether it be in the court systems, whether it be in the doctor's offices, whether it be in our churches, is that they lack the support to now address. And that narcissist, again, is not, you know, bound by rules. They're, 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 there's a whole bunch of lawlessness going on, pure rebels. So rules don't phase them. So now when you confront that narcissist, they might they might pretend they're repentant. They might gaslight even the people confronting them. And so it becomes this whole mind of mind manipulation. What happens is only the people that have been intimate with the narcissist really knows what's going on. And so this is why validation is so important. And this is why shooting the breeze is here. It's because I like to say I'm a healthy individual. I know I've been assigned by God to speak on this subject matter, but I'm here to sit here and let you know that you're not going crazy, that, you're, that you don't got to blame yourself, but God has a destiny for everyone who's in caught up in these situations. Will I tell some people to do it, you know, tell them to leave or, you know, tell them to divorce? No, but God can and God will can just instruct his people. And this is what, um, you know, I'm here to empower people with the, with the knowledge and the counsel of God. That was long winded, wasn't it? So you got to take back your lost ground. There's nothing sinful um, with that. Okay. No matter how careful you try to be, you will eventually watch this, find yourself in a bad situation. Okay. These relationships, <laughs> it ain't blessed. We talked about false covenants. We talk about deception. We talk about being bamboozled. They're predicated on lies. And so this is why this makes us very tricky because there's a lot of social pressure coming from different areas, coming from the faith community, coming from whatever. But sometimes we got to get alone with God and get God's validation, God's deliverance. Can God uh, save any situation? Absolutely he can, but we got to seek God first, okay? So no matter how careful you try to be, you will eventually find yourself in a bad situation. And this is biblical, right? We, you, you will know them by their fruit, all right? This is biblical understanding, all right? Your mate will be push, could be pushing you around. You, you will have lost some independence, but let me tell you, you can take it back. Don't let no devil intimidate you from taking back the power and the authority that God is giving you. And yes, we are subject. This is a very uh, hard topic for wives as well, especially in our faith community who are taught to submit to their husbands. 100 in the Lord, the Bible says. The scripture says in the Lord. And not everyone that calls Lord, Lord, like the scripture says, will inherit the kingdom of God. And so we got to stay woke, y'all. We can't, we got to go deeper. We got to push deeper. We got to pray deeper. We need more revelation into this matter because we're living in the last days. And the Bible says that this whole place is going to be invaded with people that you think you know. You've been judging that book by a cover and God is saying, when you open up that book, mm -hmm, it ain't going to be pretty, okay? So you will have lost some independence in these relationships if you're a narcissistic wife, but you can take this back. Narcissists rarely keep to whatever deals the two you have negotiated, whatever vows, I guarantee they've been broken, okay? 
expect to periodically have to reopen the negotiations if you have to. And then you have to be willing to keep fighting. God bless you. God bless, I love this comment. Uh, my sister Melissa says, empower yourself with the word of God. Understand it's not right how it's, they're being treated. You have rights to your dignity and respect and boundaries, especially godly boundaries. See through the lies. God will give you the strength to stand up for yourself and you're in the world. You're preaching with me, girl. All right. Be willing to keep fighting. The fight with your faith. Most narcissists end up with more control in the relationship than their mate. There becomes a complete imbalance of power. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the proper operation of power. I'm talking about the abuse of power, okay? This is because they are willing to keep fighting for what they want. The narcissist ain't backing down. The narcissist ain't turning the other cheek. The narcissist is going to fight. They wear the other person down 24 hours every day. You will expect to get worn down. If you want to be more than their, their beaten down servant or whatever, a slave, you have to be willing to fight to reclaim your lost freedoms, okay? And you will need to be prepared to fight to avoid losing even more control and autonomy and get yourself in a place where you are angry but not sin. Know how much energy and prayer and, and you need the presence of God. I see it all the time. You need the power of God to stand about against the wiles of the enemy taking, to, trying to take authority over your home, over your life. And so you've got to make sure that you are not in a place where your anger is leading you now to sin against the narcissist. Praise God. Yes, and they abuse their power because they think they can. So the punchline to answer your question in a nutshell, we, we took a long time with this, um, but yes, I have, the answer is this. I have yet to meet a wife of a narcissist who is happy because she is married to a narcissist. And the other way, he is married to a narcissist, okay? Any happiness that anyone experiences in these dynamics is because she created it or he created it or fought for it to maintain some basic rights as a, a human being with some level of autonomy and independence, all right? It's, it's pretty much somewhat of a curse. But God came to deliver us and rescue and came to set the captive free. Um, Yes, it says in the Bible, I love this, that everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. That's right. Preach it, sister. So what is the difference between gray rock and the silent treatment? This is very important because many of you have felt guilty. Yes, very, very guilty for standing your ground or just shutting off um, communication. And I want to empower someone tonight. And I also want to educate someone tonight who thinks, oh, this is, this is not right. People should be talking. People should be communicating. Let me tell you something. Not everything's pretty in the kingdom of God. Everything, the Bible says from the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. I felt that. Anyways, so what is the difference between gray rock and the silent treatment? What is gray rock? This is an interpersonal strategy that involves being as neutral and boring as possible. All right. Just like a gray rock is compared to a pe is compared to a pe peacock. So you're just going to be emotionless. You're going to be like, mm -hmm. you ain't saying a word. You ain't rolling your eyes. You ain't trying to mess up your face. You are going gray rock. Why? Who is the strategy strategy useful for? The strategy was invented as a way to be with narcissistic like exes or if you're co-parenting or have to deal with that person. If you're in court with that person, you might be in the middle of a divorce or dealing with sharing custody or still be in business even together. What's its purpose? This strategy is useful when you do not want to provoke your narcissistic ex and want to minimize contact. You don't want no crisis chaos. You don't want nobody saying, why are you making your face like that? Oh, da -da. you don't want no engagement. So you're just going to sit there like a gray rock and just, it's like, I hope they, they keep on walking, right? All right. You are literally trying to be as boring and non-confrontational. Look at that. You are trying to be non-confrontational. Remember, we're talking about the narcissist is looking for any form of supply, good attention or bad attention, all right? So the goal is to avoid a fight and to make all contact as unemotional, exhausting as possible. Who is it used with? It is used with the narcissistic ex, lover, even family members. Sometimes you just got to go to the party and be like, hey, sure, I'll have the cornbread. 
You just, there's nothing going on, all right? To minimize contact. So who usually goes gray rock? The person who is afraid. The person who is afraid of dealing with the narcissistic ex usually goes gray rock. The person that doesn't want to engage. The person who is being hoovered and being drawn in and you're trying to just, yes, I don't want no part of it, okay, without having to talk. Now, the silent treatment, there's a difference. The silent treatment involves pointedly ignoring another person and refusing to communicate them. Who is this strategy for? People do this, ignore, right, to punish someone with whom they're angry. That's where you say, see the silent treatment. This no contact, gray rocking is not the silent treatment. You are not gray rocking to punish the narcissist. In fact, it has more to do with keeping you in a set place of safety emotionally, not being manipulated psychologically, and to stop the cycle of trauma within you, which for once, isn't it okay to put you first in your mental stability and your spiritual stability and your emotional stability over the chaos of the narcissist, all right? They, in, in, sil in the silent treatment, you, they might, someone might do that to get rid of the person by driving them out of their life. Who is that strategy used for? It is used with people who are angry, with who are not comfortable directly verbally confronting. Who usually gives a silent treatment? Someone who is very angry and wants to make the other person suffer. So going gray rock is not about making the other people suffer. It's about creating and breaking a cycle for yourself. And for and the abuse, right? So as you can see from this point, point, point comparison, the underlying purposes of these two strategies are quite different. I need you to get that tonight. People generally are advised to use gray rock to avoid more trouble. Punishing is secondary if it is there even at all. If it happens, if the narcissist feels they're being punished, well, oh well. Okay, people use a silent treatment to create double trouble for the other person on purpose as a punishment. So that's a difference. Number seven, yes, you're doing anything to survive. Oh my gosh, time is going by, guys. We have about 10 minutes. Can an empath save or heal or change a narcissist? Again, not to watch last week's episode, okay? Now, I'm gonna like, I don't wanna offend nobody tonight, but this is what I think, Alicia Breeze, okay? This question makes a lot of unfounded assumptions that have no basis in facts, okay? Empathy alone, and I did a post about this the other day, empathy alone, no matter how great, cannot heal or significantly change anyone or a narcissist, okay? Um, we, we did a show last week. We talked about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, um, if a narcissist changed what it would look like, it's a biblical account. Go check it out. Empathy on its own will not change a narcissist. God, however, can because in him, with him, that's all you need. Everything is needed for that narcissist to be delivered if their will is trumped by God, all right? So these are the assumptions. We assume that there are empaths out there. I haven't figured it out. I don't know where the term come from. I should have probably prepared a little bit more to let you know. But all I know is that empaths is a social construct. That's something that somebody has created, all right? I haven't found biblical grounds for that title. So while many people might be highly empathetic and have empathy, the term empath implies that, that you have a special power. There's something special about your empathy that goes beyond the normal spectrum, okay? There's no evidence that this type of empath exist if there is let me know like that's what i'm saying like i don't know but let me know so that's why i said sidebar raps raps okay talk to tings that's what i'm saying sister okay and i want to say this though the assumption also is that extreme empathy is a good thing like i don't know where that comes from either in general people who are super high in empathy report having problems with saying no to unreasonable requests they're either e um, overly eager to believe the best about everyone, tend to have weak boundaries, and often become anxious when they are put in a situation where they have to confront someone, okay? And then the other assumption is people always benefit from being around highly empathic people. When a highly empathic person has children with a narcissist, what usually happens is that that narcissist not only abuses the, 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 the spouse or whatever, they might end up abusing the children because... Uh, emotionally or psychologically or sometimes physically because they struggle with how to protect themselves and the children. And the assumption number four is having empathy gives people healing powers. The only, the only healer in this equation is good God almighty. Okay. And, um, 
Empathy allows people to understand what other people are feeling. That's what empathy does, all right? This is not the same as being able to heal complicated mental health problems. So when people think that their empathy can save somebody, they are in error, okay? We require the Holy Spirit. We may require professionals. We need the wisdom of God while being on the receiving end of empathy can feel wonderful. It feels great, like, oh my gosh, right? So does a massage. I went and got a massage the other day. My girl said she went and got a massage the other day and it felt great. It felt great, but guess what? It doesn't have a significant effect on the person's you know, trajectory of their disorder or their narcissism. So there's no evidence that people who are extremely high in empathy can heal narcissistic personality disorder. So that's my answer for you, okay? Um, oh my gosh, we might have to do a part two. There's so much, all right? There is, number eight is, why would a narcissist call you jealous after they tried to make you feel that way by cheating or triangulations, okay? Here are the three most common reasons why someone with a narcissist might call his or her partner jealous after they behaved in a way that was likely to evoke jealousy. One, they were not actually trying to make their partner jealous. They were selfishly flirting with someone like at the poppy show party we were talking about before. They found them appealing without giving a thought to how their partner would feel, even though they were sitting there by themselves having a glass of something, right? <laughs> Cracking myself up, okay? Um, then their partner complained about the behavior, behavior. They figured the best defense was to deny everything and go on offending them. Like the narcissist is saying, you're jealous. You're just jealous. You're so insecure. They turn the tables around now and they're talking about a supposed flaw in the victim instead of their own bad behavior. So that's very typical. Number two, they were trying to make their partner jealous either as a punishment or for control or circumstance or just to get attention, okay? Then when their partner acted jealous, they were gratified. So there was some level of gratification in making the spouse jealous or the girlfriend or the boyfriend, whatever. Getting to call their partner jealous was the cherry on the top that added the pleasure. So this is like that sadistic thing where they want you to be hurt. Like they're trying to, like they're getting a high off that. And then there are those that are so grandiose that they feel entitled to do whatever they want they're just like so what that's what it is they're gonna do whatever they want to do they're gonna talk to whoever they want to talk to they're gonna you know get that person's number right in front of your face while you're standing there they truly believe that their partner has no right to object okay now they're acting as if their partner's jealousy is a character flaw instead of an inevitable effect or reaction of this crazy behavior correct and so the main reason people with narcissistic personality disorder do things that hurt their partner is because they are very self-centered. They lack emotional empathy or very high, have little. They feel entitled. You're, you're just completely insignificant to whatever their needs are in that moment. And they have a proclivity to control. Yes, I said a proclivity con to control. An exorbitant, unnatural need to control and the flirting might make them feel attractive. It gives them narcissistic supply, lifts their self-esteem. You know, it, it plays a lot, right? So calling the partner jealous just helps them to rationalize their bad behavior and avoid acknowledging the pain that they're causing, okay? Um, let me see if I have any quick questions left. We only have two minutes left. Oh, boy, I'm going to have to answer this next week. There's so much, guys. I think we're going to have to continue next week because I've only been given 60 minutes. I think we're going to do part two because we have like a whole bunch of other questions and your questions are coming in. I'm getting some DMs right now. So I think we're gonna do a part two, but let me tell you something. Go and subscribe to this channel tonight and get yourself caught up. You will not be disappointed. You will not be, you know, you will be empowered, okay? And so yes, the jealousy is crazy. There's so much crazy we have to talk about. Let me give you a precursor. We gotta talk about low functioning narcissists. Um, failed narcissists. We got to talk about um, um, the four D's of narcissism. We got to talk about what emotions narcissists don't feel. There's so much. So let us get our prayer hands up. I hope that this empowered you tonight. I believe it did because this is what we do on Shoot the Breeze. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm just praying for every single person that logged on this broadcast tonight. Father, I know there's so many questions. So many of us are like, stay up all night trying to figure these circumstances out. But Father, you said if our mind be stayed upon, you will have perfect peace. So I speak the peace of God over everybody on this broadcast tonight. 
we come against confusion and all the, all the strategies of the enemy to keep us bound up and locked up in our minds, entangled, Lord God, with emotions that are not of God. Father, we're asking you, oh God, to order our steps, oh God. We're asking you, oh God, to direct our path since we're acknowledging you right now in the name of Jesus. Cover your people, cover their minds, cover their hearts and cover their souls. And Father, I pray that we will bring ourselves back here next week. And we're gonna continue the Q&A this week, this, this session. We're gonna do another week of it because I believe there's so many things that need to be dealt with. We give God the praise and we give him the glory. In Jesus' name, as we be shooting the breeze. Yes, I got to go. The breeze, catch me on the overflow. The breeze, God bless you. Love you. Mm. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. See you on the other side.